Okay, let's get going on this. We'll be working with Photoshop entirely today. And last Thursday, whenever it was, we used basically the different cloning tools to erase things or move things of a relative distance in the image. But it didn't really give us the opportunity to put a dog back into the street scene or uh, something like that. And what I would like to do today is to talk about not just cloning what's there, but a couple of different ways to combine images, whether they start out in the same files or not. And there are three basic ways to do that. And I'm just going to go through them because I know some of you haven't done this at all. Cutting and pasting within an image. For instance, uh, I'm going to start with a Sacred Heart picture from last week and take some of the windows that are on the right and put them over on the left. Just cop copy them over. Maybe a design choice you're trying to make. And then we can cut and paste between images. So we could cut out a fire hydrant from our street scene and, and put it here in this image. And then also there are a couple of different ways to paste whole images into other images, not just fractions of them, but all. And we'll do that with being able to change the backgrounds that you see out, out a window, for instance, so you have a mountainscape or a cityscape or something and just choose which one you want, depending on what circumstance you are. But sort of two, two whole images that you, you see them through each other. A, a little bit of review, only one layer is active at a time. So whenever we're talking about doing this stuff, it, it's always applying to the active layer. Uh, control A will select everything, Control C to copy, Control V to paste, Control D to deselect in case you decide that's not what I want. Something we didn't do last time, which is if you need to select two things, like both of these windows, you can select one however you decide to do that, and then use Shift to select this guy and then copy them over together as two, two separate things going over. Pasting always creates a new layer on top of the, of the current one. We can rename layers, uh, we can merge them, we can also link them so that, let's say, a person and their shadow that we create will always move at the same time, even if they're actually two different two different layers that would go together. Now let's get this image up on the screen, and we're going to look at a couple of different ways to select things. One, we can use the various marquee shapes that we used before. Um, there's also a way you can, you can select things by color, uh, which is called the magic wand tool. Let me, let me show you just how, what that looks like. Oh, you know, uh, this guy over here, if you click this little double arrow there, you can you can bring this up into a little more just easy for me to see that way, frankly, rather than uh, all the way down the page, even though it takes up a little more space. This is how I'm, I'm used to seeing them. The magic wand tool is, is the second one down here in the right hand column. And what it does is pick things by color. So if, if I just want to grab all these gray pixels, I can just click inside there and it, it highlights all of them. If I use shift click to select some more stuff on the white, it'll, it'll select uh, both of those. And I'll go in here. There are a couple of different ways to do this. And again, it's, shift, it's picking by color. It's also selecting only the ones that are contiguous to the point that I, that I picked. If I unchecked contiguous, control D to let go, and clicked over here, I get uh, everything sort of gray all over the whole drawing, which is not what I want to do, M mortar joints and all kinds of things. Okay, uh, with, with the magic wand tool active, if I have contiguous unchecked, that means it'll pick every pixel in the whole image that's the same color. So whether it's in the mortar joint or the sky or a cloud or whatever. So normally, I almost always use contiguous. And we also have a tolerance level. So like just that exact gray, the exact same RGB value, or just close. So if we say tolerance zero and, and click in here, you'll see those are different enough that it's only picking those gray ones right next to it because there's some purples and some greens. My, right now my contiguous is on, but because my tolerance is so low, it's only getting ones that are exact matches for that. And this, all these go from zero to 100. If I do it like 10 and click here, I pick up more of them, not bad. If I make it 50, Then I get them 
I get not only these guys, but I pick up those as well. That's the tolerance up here at the top of how, how if it's 100, it'll pick every pixel on that layer. So this option bar across the top is a really important tool. Uh, it kind of sh sharp, sharpens your tool to make it select what you want it to select in a given circumstance. And sometimes it'll be tolerance of zero, sometimes it'll be tolerance of 50, you know, and, and anywhere in between. So I've done that. Then let's see what happens if I uh, if I want to keep adding. I want to pick this whole. I, I could have just picked this whole thing with the polygon marquee, but I'm, we're doing this for demonstration purposes to look at the magic wand tool. If I click out here, sh holding down Shift and click, then I get that whole that whole group right there. And I want to usually zoom back to make sure I haven't accidentally picked stuff out, out here, which can happen with the magic wand tool if you don't have contiguous turned on. Once I've selected something, I'll use Control C to copy it to the Windows clipboard. And then I can use Control V to paste it or edit paste, either one. Edit paste. And what happens is the new one gets pasted right on top of the old one. So you, you can't even tell it's happened. But if you go over to the, but you can see that we have created a new layer over here, which is that window right there. Each new layer when you create it becomes the, the current layer so you, you can work on it. So I'm gonna now select, use the move slash select tool to select it and move it over to here. And click it in place. You can use the arrow keys to nudge it a little bit. I'll say okay. And if I decide, oh, I oh I don't have the right number, let's we'll say one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, and a half, I guess that's close enough. Uh, it's a little bit rotated. We'll we'll deal with that in a bit. Um, I just want to get the idea of selection and copying within an image. Th this one was lucky because we didn't have any um any smooth tones we had to match. Uh, it just, you know, just that white square just comes right in and, and drops into place. Let's look at a different way to do it, uh, to copy this window over. And for this, I'll use one of the marquee. I can't use a rectangular marquee, uh, even though it's a rectangular window because, uh, you know, because of perspective uh, cranking it down, control D. The tool I want to use here is the polygonal lasso tool, which has straight but not rectangular edges. All these selection tools are up there at, at the very top because you usually start with them and then do stuff with the tools that are farther down. Polygonal lasso tool, and it's just a click, and a click, and a click, and a click, and then a, a double click. Uh, you can either come back to your starting point or or double click and it'll come back automatically. So there's that. So once you've picked it, once you've selected stuff, what's going to happen here? If I do control C and control V, it's going to say couldn't complete the copy command because the selected area is empty. Well, it doesn't look empty, but the reason is there's nothing here on that on that layer one. Um, I need I need to I'm selecting off of the background image. That's all you know it's, it's like trying to copy stuff out of a of an out of an empty text document. So we can leave that selection set on. That's just a, a marquee. Marquee background layer is active. Edit, copy, edit, paste, and move. Try to get the same number of. So you can see we're, we're starting to build up a, a fairly complex image. 
And it, it does matter eventually uh, what order the layers are in, um, because unlike in CAD, where in wireframe you can see everything uh, all the way down, you know, everything that's there, these are actual pixels that will obscure any pixels that are underneath them. I'd like to try something a little different. These were nice hard edges. If you would, we can leave this here and then open the um, class four files. Let's open this picture of this young man. What we're gonna do is, is give him a, an eye in the middle of his forehead. He'll be a triclops. So I was, we're gonna copy one of these eyes up. I would say we use this one because it's still got some light on the side of it here. It's not all in shadow and that's what we have up here. So what we're gonna do here is grab it, stick it up there and then come back and trim around the edges. We'll, we'll smooth the edges later so it's not too important. But let's, let's just use the lasso tool to sort of grab a nice generous area around his eye. Control C to copy, Control V to paste, and then move it in place. And this is something you'll be doing for a hundred times. It's so crazy. <laughs> we got an eye, but it's not sitting too comfortably here yet. I think we just want to make this layer one. Let's rename that. You just double click on it and call it I. And with that as the active layer, we can just erase what we don't want. I'm just gonna to go to the eraser tool. And I can start out with it being sort of sort of big right now. My I'm it's let's let's call it 10 pixels. And I'm, I'm going to set the hard, but hardness back to say 50, just to get some smoothing around the edges. And if you if you find you take off too much, you can just do Control Z. So for getting, you know, right now I've got sort of, this looks like it's a little too dark in there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my hardness down and make my brush stroke be maybe five pixels so I can start coming in here and blending it a little better with this is all um all by feel to, to get a good blend with what's what's around. Trying different sizes and Well, anyway, something like that. <laughs> so I, I think we have to admit that we're illustrators here, not documentarians in any sense. So I'm gonna save this with a new name. File save as, when you use save as, we're only offered options that preserve the layers. So it could come back and be edited in Photoshop later on. What we really wanna do here, I beg your pardon, is file, save a copy, and that will give us like the JPEG options uh, to do this. Uh, it will compress the layers. So it's just one, one flat image. Can't turn the eye on and off anymore but we'll just save young man's face, copy young man's face with extra eye. 
i.jpg. And I'll keep it with high quality. Okay. That saves it to a new file on disk, so I don't need to save the original image when I exit. Uh, let's, let's cancel. Let's, I'm going to save this as Sacred Heart edited. Save a copy. Sacred Heart entry with extra windows. Okay, so that's copying something uh, right within its own image. And usually when you do that, the, the lighting is right. It's all coming from the same direction. Relative contrasts are all the same. When you're copying something from one image into another, often you have to tweak the brightness and the contrast so they look like they're actually coming from the same place and lit by the same sun. So let's open the train image. Train engine. And I'd also like to open the old couple image. I'll open old couple walking. So what we're gonna do is take this old couple, cut them out and paste them in here, um, either on the tracks if you want to, or on the far side of the tracks or on the near side of the tracks, whatever editorial story you wanna tell there. It was easy to cut out the windows. That was those nice square edges. It was pretty easy to deal with the eyeball because we had skin tones all around and they could just sort of merge. Bringing the old people into the train image is gonna be a little tougher because we have a lot of strange background stuff. We got you know the, all these contours we need to follow. But in this case, there's really no escaping the fact we need to outline these people and, and bring them into our, our drawing. And again, I think I'll just go get there. Um, I, I won't even try to, I'm just gonna cut a rectangle out and then we'll end up trimming it back in the other, in the other image where we see how it blends with everything. So the process is just the same. We pick our, let's, let's say the rectangular marquee, just make something uh, uh, around them. And we control C to copy it here and then go to the other image and do control V to paste it. Control C to copy, go back here, Control V, and here they are. I'm gonna call them this people, P-E, people. Well, close anyhow. And we can move them around. You know, if we put them over here, they've safely gotten past the train. If we put them over here, they're walking uh, in, into the train. But we're going to have to sort of set their scale appropriately. Uh, maybe I'll put them in the street to start with. I'll put them in the street. I'll make sure they've passed the train. They're out of the way of the train over there. So here we're faced with a with somewhat tedious task, uh, which we'll we'll do as best we can of getting rid of everything that's around the edges and just leave their figures. So making their, basically turning these square pixels, uh, these pixels transparent. And to do a rough job with that, I'm gonna use the polygonal lasso tool, which works best for me. And I usually do this sort of a, a, in a couple of stages. And I found it works best to cut slightly into the figure, you can see where, where people come up uh, against, a, where any image comes up against a uh, background, there's a little bit of overlap. And part, part of that's just the best that the camera and the lens can do. And part of it is any JPEG saving is, is sort of trying to smooth things out. So I usually try to cut out, in this case, sort of cut out the green um, uh, by, by and large, so, so we don't have any weird colors around the edge. You've probably seen that in poorly retouched photographs where there's a little black edge or a white edge around something and it's called a fringe. And it's, it's something that if it's done poorly, it's really obvious where things have been pasted. If it's done well, you can't tell. And if you, you, if you just drag down off the edge of the uh, image, it will, it will pan down to accommodate, let you keep going without having to use the scroll bars. 
you just just come off to the side and it it, it moves around uh, and stays with you. And I usually try and don't try to do the whole image at one time because if you screw up, then you have to sort of start all over again. So I might do a piece, come back, close up like that, and hit the delete key and get, get rid of that. And go back and do, do his pants. But the thing to remember is what we're getting rid of is the outside, not not the not the people themselves. We'll also need to, to trim up into here to get the separation and so we can see see what's happening through them, not just around. You'll be glad to know that the internet is full of pictures of people that have already had the backgrounds removed. So if you need children on playground swings, you can get them without having a whole school building back there. And how accurately you do this depends, I guess, essentially on how close people are going to see it. If it's for a presentation where your critics are no closer than three or four feet away, you don't have to do as good a job as if it's going to be in a high resolution magazine or something other like that. If, if you've made a point that's in the wrong place, like I have right here, you can hit the backspace key and it will walk you down to the previous uh, previous points, or you can come back later and fix it or whatever you need to do. Up at the top of the page, I do say, get Photoshop for dummies. I'm giving you the super fast, just getting your feet wet version of all that photo Photoshop can do. You, you can create and light 3D objects. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, we're using it for very limited purpose here. It's a, a great tool to know how to use when so much of what we do is finally presented in images that aren't necessarily perfect to start with or match to start with. Have you guys experimented with, with MidJourney yet? It's an artificial intelligence program. There are a couple of different places you can get to it on the web where you type in what you want to see an image of, and it creates the image with an AI. It works by having a vast store of images, called off the internet, I guess, um, photographs, uh, every kind of thing. And if you, I mean, I typed in derelict GTO in front of abandoned barn in the style of Walker Evans, black and white. And in about 20 seconds, there are four completely different photorealistic images of different GTOs in front of different barns. And, and some of the architectural work coming out is, you think it's done in Photoshop, but it's done with, with, uh, with one of these. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. And believe it or not, it's not finding these images, it's creating them out of pieces of other images. All you do is type in the prompt up at the top and the image below, actually four images below are what you get out of it. Just Google mid journey architecture and a lot will pop up. Anyway, back to our old couple who are outside my barbershop. shop. 
there are two things I like, I like to bring your attention on this. Um, one is uh, their size depends on how, how far away they are. And if they're on the tracks, that might be about their right height. You know, about to get hit by the train. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna rescue them. You know, if I put them over here in the street, then, you know, their feet are in the street, but, but they're too big. So we, 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 need to, we need to have a control over scaling them. And that's here with, with that layer selected, the, the, the people, all these geometric editings are, are here under, basically this deals with sort of color issues and this deals with geometry issues. So we go to edit, transform, we get a bunch of different things we can do just with those pixels on the screen. We can we can flip them vertically, we can flip them horizontally, we can stretch them, we can pull them, whatever. Let's just use scale just to start with. And if I make them big, you know, they can be over over here paying no attention to the train, but no big deal because they're they're close to us. So you're, we're sort of telling a little story here. If we want them in the street, you know, then we. Actually, you know, there's a person over there, I think. Oh, and with all of these, it's just like in Revit. Once you've got it the way you want it, then you hit the, the check mark to say, okay, I'm done. And it's safely made it across. And one last little thing here, I'm not going to work on this too hard, is you'll notice that in the picture, in the picture, the sun is coming this way, hitting this side of things. And with them, it's hit mostly hitting on his shoulder. So I think we'll just flip them right this way, just so they start to fit. So there's that. This is a geometric, so it's under edit, transform, and that's flip horizontal. They don't have a good shadow on them, which really helps locate people in space. And we'll get to that with one of the other uh, images to put that in. If I want them to look like they're over on the sidewalk, edit, transform, scale. And go ahead and get, get a haircut or whatever they do. Enter. Or, or you can hit, hit enter when, when you get to that point. If I want them to look really like they're part of that landscape, I, I can have them go behind the car. And there are two ways to do that. One is to erase the guy's legs. But if I want to move them, then he doesn't have any legs. So what I'm going to do here is just make a copy of like the front part of this car and put it up on top of his legs. Let me just do that. So that's uh, polygon. Don't know where I want him. It's getting a little. I don't know what's going on down there. Two clicks. Uh, control C. Oh, okay. Now, I, I drew that with their layer being active, which I always do, uh, instead of the background layer, which is where I want to be copying it from. But the nice thing is. That this, this marquee doesn't belong to any layer. So I can just say, oh, I did it there, but I'll just make this active. And now I can do control C to copy, control V to paste. And now here's my, um, well, let me grab it. So there's, there's that. So I need to start labeling this. So layer one, I had, this is people, two clicks, people. This is car front. So now I can get the people, get them, put them in place, get the car front, put, uh, put it in place. But I need to put the car front on top. So it's hiding, like so I'm just clicking and dragging and putting the car front on top. So now they're sort of part of the, part of the scene. Okay, let me save this.
So this I'm going to save two ways. I'm going to save this as a Photoshop file with all these layers in it, because I might want to come back and use this in a, another demonstration. And I'm going to save it as a, as a flat JPEG. So first I'll go to File, Save As, and this will save it as a Photoshop document with all the layers in it. If I want to come back and do another version of this where the people are close to the train or we, we come right back in and edit, keep on editing it. If it's PSD, if it's JPEG, it's just flat and it's just pixels that we can't, we don't have the layers built in. Uh, maximize compatibility, sure, whatever that means. Okay. And now I'm going to save it, this image as a, as a JPEG that I could put on the internet or something rather. So that's file, save a copy, save a copy. Actually, I can just do this. I can just change it from Photoshop document to JPEG. Sorry, JPEG. And that'll be okay. Let's close that. Open. Well, let's open the train again since we're familiar with it. Um, we're going to use the train with these young people who already have a transparent background. Train engine JPEG open. When you're bringing a whole image into another one, we don't have to open a second file to place one in another. If I just want to go get those young people and put them in, into this image, I can go to File, Place. We have two choices between Play, oh, and we can also go to Adobe Stock Images just to look for stuff because because that a lot of that comes free from uh, with the U of L accounts. But place embedded means that image is dropped in here and it exists in our image regardless of what happens to whatever is on disk. If you say place linked, that means that any changes to the file on disk will be reflected here in this image, which we don't want to do. Let's go to file place embedded. I'm going to get these. Uh, young people walking and that's a png portable network graphics file which includes the ability to have transparent pixels and somebody has gone to the effort to do all that erasing for us so it, it already has a transparent background we can say place and in they go and then we can scale them wherever we want them to be And you see that, you know, somebody's done a really nice job trimming that up for us. And there are lots of these out there. Pinterest is full of them. That's probably where this one came from. These people as well, the sun's coming in a different direction. So we're going to flip them. We'll, we'll select this uh, young people walking, edit, transform, flip horizontal. And now they sort of fit, fit in, the, they fit right in, you know? And and she's she's looking at the train. So you know, there's sort of a nice, a, a, a nice little sort of you know, sociological thing going on. So uh, I just want to introduce to in that to there's lots of images already there with the backgrounds taken out of them for people, for furniture, for artwork, all sorts of stuff we might want to stick into our our renderings or our final images or uh, even part of maybe Revit materials when we get there, and then. We can also use file place to put the whole image there. Now, when you when you place a whole image into another one, we can see, let's say I wanted to change the color of his bag or put a logo on there or something or edit out the text. Yeah, okay, let's see, let's see I realize, oh, when I flipped it, I, I got his words backwards. So I really wanna, I wanna erase those. If I go to, I'll just, I just wanna use the clone tool to sort of sort of clean that up. So if I go to with them active and I go to the clone stamp tool, which I always forget where to clone stamp, when it's brought in, it's what's called a smart object is not yet editable at the pixel level. It's like it's like it's been dropped in place. It's sort of like a piece of Revit furniture. It's like there and you're not going to be able to pull the arms off and stuff. Um, so what we need to do with that. Let me see if I let me see if I can paint on it. It says this smart object. Whenever I'm trying to edit the, what's normally a pixel sort of operation, this smart object must be rasterized before proceeding. Edit contents will no longer be available. I'm not sure what that means. Rasterize a smart object. Um, I'm going to cancel that just to show you how to do it when the when the time comes. This, so this is that smart object uh, layer. And if I right click, 
I can rasterize that layer, meaning turn it back into editable pixels. Rasterize layer. So now it's easy, gonna be easy to clone this stuff down. Clone. So to fix that, we can just use the clone tool just like we did in the homework. Now, something else we can do with these, now that we have these multiple layers, we can make them lighter or darker or more, more contrasty or more saturated uh, independently. And I think what I'm gonna do is make the sun shine a little less brightly on our, on our couple. Now that it's been selected, all the, all the sort of color and brightness tools here under image, and I'm just gonna go first of all to the easy ones, uh, adjustments, with, these are the main ones. I'm gonna say brightness and contrast and maybe take the sun down a little bit on them just to sort of make them blend in better with the shadows. You know, we could have them on this side of the tracks and the old people on the other side of the tracks. I, I mean, you know, it's like young people and old people. Yeah, anyway, so, that's up to you. I, in my renderings, when I'm putting people in little figures in the background, I really enjoy telling little stories about them, like the kid who's going like this and the mom who's going like that and stuff. Anyway, so there they are. I think they fit a little better. Okay, just eyeballing it. I'm going to make them a little smaller here. I, I want to put it. I want to give them shadows for their feet to show them they're, that they're really on the ground. So I want them smaller. So that will be uh, edit, transform, scale, a little smaller. I don't know, somewhere like that. There are a couple ways to do shadows. I, I could just start a new layer and sort of try to paint a shadow in there. Let me see how that works. And on the layer menu, the layer page, there's a, um, a little plus button, which means new layer. And this is a layer that I wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna sort of paint some gray stuff over here. Uh, and a lot of times I have to do this with furniture when I've brought it into a rendering. If, if it, you know, if I've gone to all the effort to make the rendering, got it already, and they want another chair or some plants or something, I'm not gonna go back and re-render the whole thing. I'm just gonna, try to find some somewhere and stick them in. So the shadow will be basically on the ground here and they'll be on top of it. So I wanna bring the, this shadow layer down underneath the, the, the kids and I'll call this shadow. And I'm gonna start out just by, by painting some sort of black soft blobs. I'll use the paint tool, brush tool. I'm gonna make the size be kind of small. Well, maybe a little bigger. And the, the hardness way, way down, you know, 10% or something rather. And I'm gonna color it black and then we'll make it transparent. So to make it black, I'm gonna, since I have a black alternate color, I'm gonna just click those to make it now be the current one and seeing the direction that the shadows are going, I'm just gonna sort of give some uh, shadowy looking shapes like that. And we know those shadows are too strong. I'm not gonna make them gray. I don't want them opaque. I want them transparent. I wanna be see, able to see the road and the train tracks through there. So this shadow, I'm gonna change its opacity down to maybe 50%. And just, you know, to something that looks sort of like, uh, like this over here. And maybe that's a little too much. So I might just go back and erase something off of here. I don't know. So it's not a photorealistic 
shadow, but it gives the sense that their their feet are meeting the ground, and that's all I'm really trying to do. Uh, if anybody's arguing about that not being their shadows, I don't you know I don't care. There is one other way to do that. Uh, it's another option. Let me turn that layer off, which is to use their own image as the beginning of of the shadow itself. And just watch on this one because it's a it's a a couple of steps that aren't necessarily obvious and following along will be tough. But I'm going to duplicate that layer. And we're going to call this people shadow. And here it is. <laughs> it's like twins. Um, so we're going we're gonna to mess with this, first of all. I'm going to take, so people shadow. I'm going to do a couple things too. I'm going to go to image um, adjustments, hue and saturation, desaturate it completely, just down to black and white. Um, take the lightness down to to there. Take the opacity down to like that. And then I'm going to sort of stretch and contort this to be the, to make it look more like their shadow. So that would be under edit, transform. Uh, I forget which one of these will work best. We'll I'll start with rotate, sort of get it down like this or something. I, th I think distorts the good one. Edit, transform, distort. Anyway, so that has a little more sort of verisimilitude. You know, maybe there's some up there that I don't really want. That's his bag or something. Rather, I could I could erase that back if I wanted to. Um, but you generally try to get the, that direction matching the direction of the rest of the shadows in the drawing, and it'll look uh, pretty okay. Uh, I do need to move that shadow right now. His shadow is crossing hers, so I need to her, so I need to bring that back down here as well. So, so. You know, voila. Now you know all my Photoshop tricks. The first thing to do to change the view out the window is to change the background, which is a pane to edit, to a regular layer, which is easy. Just click on the little lock icon. Then get rid of the existing view by selecting each area that you don't want to appear and hitting the delete key. Here I'm using the, polyg the polygonal lasso tool. I'm going to speed up this next bit just to get through it faster. But when you are doing it, wait a second or so between clicks, or Photoshop will think you are double clicking to finish the selection, which is not always helpful. I decided to leave the reflective glass here and want it eventually to be transparent to our exterior image. So I'm going to select it, but instead of deleting it, I'll right click it and choose to cut it out of this layer and make it into its own separate layer. Now I'm going to rename these layers just so it's, they're easy to keep track of. And here I'll finish trimming out the existing backyard uh, just very roughly. We can fix it uh, towards the end. Like just like just as we did for the old people. I'll speed this up too.
So let's go get us a background image. We can paste from the clipboard directly into Photoshop. We don't need to save it as a separate image on disk first. Now we put it outside the window. Come back and clean up the kitchen. And adjust the brightness inside to make the whole thing look a little more realistic. Experiment with the transparency of the glass to see what looks good. And call it a day.